Hey, welcome back to Above Board with Canderpath. I don't know why I say welcome back because this might be the first time you're ever here. So welcome or welcome back or all of the above. But I'm here with one of my best buddies, John Kennedy. How you doing, bro? I'm all right. It's funny. So I find that I always say the same script like anytime I intro the podcast. Yeah. I say the same thing and I say welcome back. And I'm thinking like we change it up next time and just like scream into the microphone like bazinga or like just, just really something. get people's attention. You just know, something, like this, right? Or just know. thank our sponsor and just name some like ridiculously large company that that does not sponsor us, but just to sound impressive. Like right yeah. out of the gate, before we get started, I want to thank, you know, I yeah. want to thank Oprah for calling right. me yesterday. I was, yeah. We're, we're going to thank Nike for the sponsorship I was that so, we have. <laughs> I, was so, I was so excited about my book coming out because my book, Inspired Excellence, came out recently. And then I listened to a podcast with... um. Uh, is it Albert or Arthur Brooks? Gosh, why can't I ever remember his name? Um, last name Brooks. He wrote the book From Strength to Strength. He's amazing. And I was listening to him on the Tim Ferriss podcast. And he just wrote, co-authored a book with Oprah. And he Oof. was talking about how he was at like her Montecito house and they were sitting together and how she would call him and say, I've, I've come up with a different idea. And I'm like, what? suddenly my book seems so not impressive because I no, see a this is Oprah. not how you should think of it actually how I think of it is like like through my eyes you're my Oprah so <laughs> like, like when I have stuff going on why well, I pick up the phone and I call my Oprah and you never call me for advice you're self-sufficient I 100 percent have the difference have. is you know yeah. we we're also neighbors and I get to knock on your door instead of call you but so what's going on? I think today we wanted to talk a little bit about that. I think we wanted to talk about, you know, I, I one time was talking to John when we were thinking about different topics and I was talking about this, this concept of like an emotional bank account. And it's, it's a broad range topic. It could be professional, personal, but it's, it's usually used as a, as in terminology for how you're doing things or taking actions to invest in other people. So in a relationship, you're contributing to the emotional bank account of your significant other by giving them flowers or complimenting them or taking a chore off their list that they normally do. Um, at work, you invest in the emotional bank account by giving reward and recognition to your team or job well done or, you know, I always think about, I know you have an actual Michael Scott working in your firm, but shout out to think, Michael Scott, Michael Scott. but I always think about Michael Scott from, from the office, which I've been binge watching season one, two, and three again, because I think they were my favorite and literally how he would just get like, come out of the office. You're like, that's it. Everybody we're taking the day off. We're going on a booze cruise. You know, he would just randomly do these things that in his mind were awesome investments in the emotional bank account. But I just picture being Stanley. Sometimes I think I'm Stanley, just like, why are we going on this booze cruise, Michael? You know? <laughs> so anyway, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about that, but also just to see, was that, did I do a good job? Was that that was a really good Stanley. But it's just, I'm thinking, and for our listeners that, that know my full name, it's John F. Kennedy, right? So I've spent my whole life dealing with the tension whether I wanted it or not towards my name. And then I married a Jackie. So, you know, that's weird. Uh, that were that our names are John and Jackie Kennedy, and so like now with Michael, like I bring him into meetings, and I just, he sees it coming, and he just he's such a good sport, and he, he, but I'll say like, and this is Michael Scott, and I just make this big deal about his name, and in my mind, I'm like, well, I've dealt with it my whole life, like Michael Scott's only been a name for a part of your life that you know what when did that become famous? 2005, 10, yeah. whenever that show came out. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's a little bit unfair to him. He's always a good sport, but I always love directing attention to his name because it takes away from my name sake attention, right. which I guess, you know, I don't know. Do you think about my name being weird? Is that weird to you that we're John and Jackie Kennedy or well, is that my just kids like, call you, not on your radar cause, anymore? Cause my kids call you uncle Johnny. So I just think of that. I don't know if anybody calls you Johnny, but I call you Johnny, which I don't think is really what you go by, but I've always called you John or Johnny. I think I call you John. You, now only I'm you and my mother when I was seven years old are the only people that call me Johnny. And my kids, your Uncle Johnny, they don't call you Uncle John. I know. Yep. 
I, I never thought I like it. It's that. endearing. It's nice. I, I like that that I have a nickname in your household. Me and Mrs. Kennedy. Anyway, so let's talk. What's what's on your mind? I, I love doing that to you. I love to just suddenly turn the spotlight to you because I know you're just so comfortable with that. What's on your mind as it comes to the emotional bank account? Sweating bullets. Well, we I, I think this was this conversation was fortuitous for me. I guess I get to have like a that's free a therapy ass. session. That, that's a big word. I said I said I think I said a curse word accidentally. I didn't. I didn't but, hear it. We'll bleep it. That's a big um, word. A big old word. Fortuitous. Yeah. Well, I feel like this. I, I ended up getting. I, I get to have an opportunity for like free therapy with you, Let's recorded and then shared to anybody who wants to listen. But I, the idea of it, obviously, is a great play on words with what we do in the financial world. Putting money. Putting what was it? Putting money in, in the your emotional, emotional bank. bank. Putting, I already investing forgot. in the emotional bank account. I think that's a fun play on words. So what, like my mind kind of thinks towards all these areas of, well, you, you know, as I always hear like those, those gurus that are like, oh, no. that. it's like, I wake up at 4am. I, w- <laughs> I work out. I've had a gallon of water by 430. I've taken a cold. I've done my cold plunge. I've read, I read the entire Bible and I did everything before my kids woke up at six. So like I, I hear you hear those. So we follow people that talk like yeah. that sometimes. I and, I, do, and, and I so, do some of that stuff, but I I also also it's involved drinking coffee with unhealthy sugar free cannoli flavored creamer, and I do write in a gratitude journal, but I don't take a cold plunge. So yeah, you're all these people that you know all the all the self help gurus of the world that. They, I've done. They, I've done more before six a.m. than you'll do in your entire week. Like that, they. Some of them are aggressive and they say stuff like that on on their shows. Yes. But uh, what's well, so, so for one? I feel like when you hear those things, you could start to kind of get down on yourself because you're like, I can't do all this things. Because it's not necessarily possible, especially with small no. kids. But I will say, I always think of life as like this wheel, and you always talk about how there's no such thing as work-life balance. I forget the term you like to use. Blend. But I think of it in terms of this wheel. And so yeah. these different areas of your life on a scale of one to 10. So like your family, you know, rank on a scale of one to 10. How much do you feel like you're investing in that? You're doing well in, in being involved, present, whatever. Your work life. Uh, so your vocation or um, maybe your friendships, maybe your finances, maybe whatever. And like the wheel just feels bumpy to me lately. And well, I, yeah. I find, you know, I'm investing a lot of time in work. And so it's it's coming at the sacrifice of maybe the the feelings that I have on the family side, like spending more time with my kids, finding those moments. I don't know. I feel I feel out of balance. Well, I guess, and I'll, I guess I'll tell like, you. So here's something. Um, you know, we all navigate the world, and we all drive down a lot of different roads. Um, you don't spend a lot of time on Grace Street, and while your daughter's middle name is that, and it should be a good reminder. I think you are somebody that gives a lot of people slack and grace, but I have not known you to give yourself a lot of grace. And I think on your journey, because you're such a hard driver and a high performer and you expect so much out of yourself, and I don't think it's a lack of maturity on your part because quite honestly, I think you're as mature, if not more mature than I am, and I'm 20 years older than you. But I do find that with you, and maybe some of our listeners can relate to this, you're extremely hard on yourself and I think somewhat unrealistic in what you can accomplish. And you're afraid to admit that, I think, because by admitting that, I think you've determined that that's maybe a sign of weakness. And I think you have to redefine for yourself what being successful is. And I think that you have some of the recordings in your brain of like, you know, everybody from David Goggins, Goggins to Wilm Hoff to, to, you know, all of these people that we talk about, Rich Roll and, and, and Ed Milet. And, you know, I mean, a lot of those people are at a level where they, they really, you know, they're super successful. And I'm not saying they didn't work hard and hustle and start from the bottom, but they're generally at a point where their schedule is their own. Uh, you know, they determine what they do and don't want to do. They fly when they do or don't want to fly. They have private jets, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and they're great to listen to and to learn from. But, you know, I think with you, like many people, that you don't give yourself a lot of slack. So when you're giving yourself no slack, think about the literal term. Slack is, you know, letting up on the rope, letting up on the leash a little bit. If everything's always pulled as tight as it can be with no slack given, 
then how can you ever feel balanced or blended? You're you're always going to feel that you're not doing enough in one area or another. And I've not known you as good as you are at a lot of things. You give your significant, you give your wife slack, you give your kids slack, you give your friends slack. I know there's things that I've had to, was supposed to do and I'm like, Hey, I'm sorry. I got a call or I got this. And you're like, no problem. Like you might be, you know, seething at me and cursing my name. I'm on really your not though. That's the but thing. I, that's I'm the not, thing, you but, give people but, yeah. slack, but you don't give yourself slack. And I think you, a lot of people struggle with this. I, I think it's a, it's the hustle culture, right? And it's, it's very, it's, you know, it started in the eighties, you know, my generation, you know, what was it? Greed is good. And, you know, bust your, you know, work is hard, hard. I'm going to outwork the next person. And there's nothing wrong with that, but there does come a time where we reach a certain, look, if you're in pain and the bottle said, take two Tylenol, how many Tylenol do you take? Real question. Two. Okay. So would you say, wow, if two Tylenol release pain, then 14 Tylenol much make, must make the pain really good. Would you think that? Uh, no, of right. course not. But yet in life, sometimes you and many people disregard the safe recommended dose and go to just an insane level and then are kind of taken aback. And I do it too. I do it too. I do it too. I do it too. You do. And then are taken aback by like, why do I feel like I'm going to die today? Why am I having chest pain? Why am I exhausted? Why am I snapping at everybody? Why didn't I sleep last night? Why did I wake up at 4 a.m. You know, freaking out about an email that I sent? And I think that's where it stems from. I think it stems from not giving yourself grace. And literally, that's your daughter's middle name. And and it's it's a word that you should maybe reflect on. Yeah. So something that's interesting as you as you shared all that, I would say that my personality, even like through through youth, like youth sports or academics or whatever it was, I never felt like, and I've made this a part of my identity. So I never felt like I was the smartest kid or the strongest or the fastest or the best at at playing first base or whatever. Like, you know, I'm thinking back to like, you know, playing baseball as a kid, whatever. But like, I always felt like the edge I had was that I would outwork, that I would just spend more time. And um, it's it's funny because I, <clears throat> so Jackie used to, when we first started dating, well, we met in our final year in college. And um, not unlike many college kids, you go to college parties, right? And so Jackie would be like, hey, are you coming out to this thing? Or, you know, we had friends that were doing, so are you doing this? And I'm like, no, I'm studying. She was just like, finally one day, she's like, boy, you study a lot. Like, what is the deal? What is the deal with that? And I'm like, well, I, you know, and I, it's not like I got, I mean, I got good grades in college, but it's not like I was valedictorian or something, you know, but I just worked really, really hard to be at the level that I was at. It wasn't this gift that I was just like, I could lay my hands on a book and absorb it all and like, and take a test and get a hundred. That was just a lot of applied effort. So it became my identity in my professional career of like, I'm the scrappy kid that like, it's just going to work harder. You know, does that make sense? It I makes that's a, probably, it makes, it probably makes a lot unpacking of sense. like stuff that should be unraveled and figured out, but that's, no, that's I think you figure it out as you go. Let me ask you a question. When you reflect back on college, do you ever say, I wish I would have studied a lot more? No, never, never. That's an interesting never. answer. Do you ever then say, and I'm not expecting an answer one way or the other. Do you ever say, I wish I would have gone to one or two more parties, or I wish I would have gone on that trip, or I wish I would have hung out with this person, or is is there ever any time that you, so if you don't wish that you would have studied, don't think, wow, I should have studied more. Then the opposite, do you ever say, man, I wish I would have been more present and enjoyed some of the things that are college-ish? Sort of. So not in college, not, not in college. I, I don't, I don't apply that logic to like parties or whatever. Right. That, that stuff never was, uh, was of much interest to me, but, but I, no I will parties, say maybe social. probably more, well, no, what, the, where I was going to go with this was like in a different stage of my life in my, in my twenties, you know, we, we just worked so hard and we saved money. We saved, like, we didn't do anything. We just saved. And so now I look back and I'm like, well, pre-kids, 
probably could have taken another trip or two to Europe, probably could have gone and done a few things that we you know, like now just having the understanding of how busy and difficult life can feel sometimes with running a business, trying to maintain friendships, relationships, families, children, household, that you know, probably should have enjoyed that more. Do you those, th- are, those are types of experiences that I think right. are like going to another college party. I don't look at that. No. And I'm like, Oof, no. I wish I should have done that. But, you know, going to Ireland probably could have been a cool trip that we never did. You know? Do you think, logically speaking, let's just go three to five years. Do you sit here and could you say to me in 2030 or whatever, life and work and my family stuff is going to probably be 30, 40% easier? And more maintainable. No, yeah, it's not. I don't think it's going to be easier. <laughs> yeah. Well, so it's funny because I'm looking at Rich. Like for anybody who's watching the video, I'm looking at this. I'm like, we didn't pre-script this question. No. Like I don't know where where yeah, he's going not. with this. No, it's not. And and <clears throat> and that's that's the thing that is. I think that people think you know this better than anybody. Do you not have people that you invest for? And they work their butts off their whole lives. And I'll make it a man. And the man retires. Do you not have a lot of people that they retire and then they pass away a short time after? Sure. It's such a heartbreaking scenario. It is heartbreaking. And what's heartbreaking about it is that nobody on their deathbed says, I wish I would have spent more time at work. Nobody does. I don't believe it. I mean, you could take all of the influencers out there who are calling people, you know, poor and making fun of them for not being billionaires. And I get up at four 30 and all I do is work. And, you know, I, I, I listen to some of them for entertainment and I think there's good to be, there's, there's lessons to be learned from everybody, but you know, I'll tell you what lesson I learned and I'm still applying it. So please don't think that I've got it figured out because I don't, my mom died. Um, it's going to be, it's almost two years now. So October 5th will be two years. So we're coming up on it. And she died on her 91st birthday. And I remember two or three weeks before she fell, so before the injury that led to her passing, I just randomly brought her coffee and I was talking to her. And I asked her two questions. I said, mom, you're 90 years old. Do you feel like it went by fast? And she said, yes. She said, it feels like it went by extremely fast. It it feels like I blinked and I was graduating high school. I blinked and I was on my wedding day. I blinked and I was a mom. I blinked and I was, you know, my kids were going away and getting married. I blinked and my husband died. I blinked and I, you know, was living alone and going out with my friends. And I blinked and now I'm this old lady and I'm not going to live much longer. And then I asked her, is there, are there things that you wish you would have done more? And she said, I wish I wouldn't have taken things so seriously. And I wish I would have laughed a little bit more. And my mom had a pretty good life. You know, my mom did for considering we were kind of lower middle class to middle class, but they did, they stretched their money. They did things. They went on vacations, I mean, externally, but, you know, I walked away from that conversation and then my mom literally passed away three weeks later, I think. And I, I walked away from that conversation with a heavy feeling on me. And it took a while, it took about a year, but that's when I started going to therapy every week because I realized that I am, it is going by fast. And I realized that I am not only out of balance, but I'm not even blending well. And I realized that I don't really do anything for myself. I don't cut myself any slack. I don't play golf. I don't have hobbies. I don't really go out with friends that much. I mean, we do with some couples and stuff, but I'm I'm really bad at that. I saw a statistic that was, kind of made me laugh in a sad way. And it said they asked, I don't know if it was 60, six-year-old married couples. And the husband, 60% of the husband at 60 said their best friend is their wife. 30% of the wives said their best friend was their husband, which really kind of made me go, holy crap. Like, and you know why? Because just using that, women tend to be a little bit better about building a social circle, about maintaining sure. friendships, about reaching out than guys do. And I think 
a lot of times when you feel that feeling of of stress and like there's so much to do, it's maybe just pulling an awareness out and floating above your body and realizing there's always going to be too much to do. There's no end. There's no end. There's no day where you go to work and go, gosh, darn it. Everything's caught up. The market is perfect. All my clients are happy. I don't have any calls. There's nobody upset. Jackie's thrilled. The kids are great. I think today I'm just going to go to the beach. I just, it doesn't ever happen. Do you know the last time I felt that way? When? I did feel that way. I felt that way. The day that I found out that I passed the CFP. Yeah. When I found out I passed, it felt like this lift, this burden off my shoulders of studying nights and weekends and just literally every extra ounce of time I had, I studied. We actually, yeah, I talked about going to Europe earlier, like in my 20s. One of the things we did was we took a trip to um, Italy and the whole trip, the whole trip I studied for the CFP on that trip. Wow. And so, um, so yeah, I... I felt that way. And I, I liken it to like um, being a kid and school's out for summer. Like that feeling of like all these birth, like How the, long did all it the last? workload, all that stuff. How long did That's it last? That's a good question. It lasted no longer than like two or three days. And I'm the same way. I remember like that next mm-hmm. Monday, I was like right back at it. I'm like, I'm back in it again. I'm the same way. Literally, you know, my book came out. I did a conference. Um, I did great at the conference. I nailed it. I the audience went nuts. I got a standing ovation. It was like my bosses were all, it was like, I did, uh, it was one of the better thing. I was like super happy. Everyone, the feedback about the book was great. And I felt good for less than a week, maybe four days. And then I went right back to feeling like, yeah, I'm, I'm not all that. And I need to work harder. And listen, I, I'm, I'm, I, everything, a lot of what I say is self-hypnosis and I think you as well. You know, a lot of what I'm saying is is things that I need to hear. But I just watch you and I I always worry because I kind of feel like you're so results driven and many people can relate to this. That the reason why you felt great about your your getting that designation, getting your your license was because you could measure it was a measured success. And then after that, it just like you know me doing a a, a book launch or a, a, a great talk, you get the response, and it's that buzz that only lasts for so long. Hey, that, that's why so many rock stars are drug addicts, right? They get hmm. in front of eighty thousand people screaming their name. Can you imagine what that feels like? And then they go back to their suite at the hotel, and there's maybe a party. Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't, and then they're by themselves. And there aren't 80,000 and you can only get, I've been watching the Tyson Fury um, documentary, uh, the boxer who supposedly retired and all you pick up from this, it's, it's amazing is that he needs to continue boxing and without it, he doesn't feel like he offers very much and it's heartbreaking in some ways and you hope for, you, you root for him. But I think a lot of people, the emotional bank account of other people Okay, so we always talk about the emotional bank account, putting the money in other people's emotional bank accounts. But here's the funny thing that we don't think about. So if I went to you as a financial advisor and I said, Mr. Kennedy, I want to put $50,000 in my emergency fund at Chase Bank. This is a very simple question. It's not a trick question. What do I have to have to put $50,000 in my Chase Bank? emergency savings account. What what do I literally have to have to put that in the account? The $50,000? Boom. Okay. <laughs> I was like, well, I, I think I know where he's going with this. So yeah. that's the thing we forget. When we start talking yeah. about investing in the bank account of your kids and of your wife and of your employees and of your team and as entrepreneurs, as teachers, as nurses, our patients, whatever it is, we have to remember that investing in the bank account, you have to have something to invest to begin with. And that's where we have to start with self a little bit. And yeah. that's why I believe everybody has to have some kind of spiritual practice. I think it starts with that. And I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's, I believe in God and I, I, you know, that's my role, but that's where, that's how I roll. But maybe somebody else, it's different. Maybe it's, you know, whatever, but I think you have to connect to something bigger than yourself. And I think you have to give yourself these moments where you you cut yourself some damn slack 
Because if you don't, what's all yeah. of this for? Uh, what? Yeah. What is it for? I mean, twenty billion dollars. What's it for? If you're freaking stressed because you're not twenty five billion dollars, you know these people that are like got you know five hundred foot yachts and they're pissed because someone has a five hundred and six foot yacht. Like, what's it for? At some point, if you're not starting with what is the currency, and the currency is love, the currency is a spiritual path, the currency is taking care of yourself, the currency is your mental and physical health. You're very good at prioritizing your physical health. How good are you at prioritizing your mental health, do you think? Yeah, it's funny you say that because I don't know if you remember, and certainly maybe some listeners do, but when we had Kristen Holmes on the podcast from Whoop, she was the the data scientist at Whoop, the thing that I wear on my wrist every day. And uh, we were talking about this and she stopped me in the middle of whatever my monologue was about, I don't remember, but she stopped me and she goes, you're the kind of person that has no problem working out seven days a week for an hour and applying that effort. But you're also probably the kind of person that can't sit still on his own thoughts for 15 minutes. Yeah. And that's a problem. And that, you know, and that's where, that's where I really started this self-discovery, I guess, of like, chronic activation like your central nervous system just always being on like always being prepared i guess another example would be like always being in that fight or flight mode you know like we're always being attacked by the proverbial lion even when we're not but when you live at that level of angst all the time like it's gonna wear you down so you're not wrong i mean i i definitely apply the physical stuff more than than the mental upstairs stuff and i think i'm starting to reframe that honestly that's what this conversation is kind of about and i'm kind of curious maybe just to ask you a question directly, like what are some other ideas? Cause I, I like the way you framed it. Like you, if you wanted to put those deposits in your bank account, you need to physically make the $50,000 before you could put the $50,000 into your savings account. And so how do you find the capacity to make that emotional currency to, to invest that into your emotional bank account? You know, when, when, you're so busy when you're, I mean, no, not everybody can just take like a, like a three month sabbatical and just leave work. No, and I'm curious. I'm asking also for myself selfishly, but then just like anybody listening to this, it's like, man, I'm jiving with what these two are talking about right now. Yeah. Like it's, what would be some ideas that you might apply? Some ideas are, are the following. First of all, I think just like you can, most people that I talk to find the time to do things that they think quote bring them pleasure so or or that they think serve them so whether it's working out whether it's scrolling social media whether it's watching real housewives of you know Beverly Hills whether it's you know consuming uh you know I don't know TikTok I don't know whatever it is right people usually I heard a term recently called doom scrolling have you heard this term before yeah, doom scrolling. And I forget what it doom means. Doom scrolling, where you just like you get well, you just get caught in the loop of like, you know, if you're Negative. on TikTok or whatever, right. you're just looking at you're looking at the Rich B's videos on on social media and like you just keep scrolling like you just you go to the next video and the next thing you know, you look up and you're like, Well, 35 minutes just went by and I, I think it's designed that way. Actually I nothing. I think it's designed yeah. that way because I think I know I sound like a conspiracy theorist, but I think sometimes our society and 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 the way our society is been created is that they don't want people to think for themselves anymore. The media wants to tell yeah. you what to think. Politicians want to tell you what to think. I think that that we have become a society, if you look at how Gen Z is, where they're very, very controlled by what they're being, what's being pushed at them. And there are agendas of the people pushing these things at them. So I think my put taking off my tinfoil hat for a second, I think that one of the things that you should do is you should find some time for mental decluttering. And mental decluttering could take the shape of, and this is aside from working out, because you and I do not use working out as mental decluttering. We think we do, and maybe we do a little bit, but it's also a thing that we feel driven to do for our fitness, for our goals. I want to look a certain way. I want to be this weight. I want my arm. I want to curl this much. I mean, I think 
we've probably both landed with, it's probably a little bit of mental decluttering and it helps us kind of get out some of our excess energy. But I think it's, it's a combination of wanting to not die and vanity. <laughs> so I think that's more of what it is. At least I'm honest about it. That's what I think it is. No, you you are. And I mean, unfortunately I do, I think you're right. I will say it's become such a part of my routine though, that when I don't do it, I feel I, I can feel a difference. Like like I like I feel I do feel the benefit of I do too. I mean there's definitely a benefit and it's, to it. I mean there's yeah. a benefit to it, but it's just like the Tylenol thing. Like, you know, so working out for an hour is good. So does that mean working out for six hours is better? No. You'll kill yourself. Right. You'll hurt yourself. You'll you're injure right. yourself. So mental decluttering, yeah. number one, it is getting out of your present mental state. And how do you do that? Well, you meditate. Well, everybody's huh, a lot of my people are like, oh God, more with the meditation crap. I can't meditate. I love people. I can't meditate. You can meditate. Everybody can meditate. Meditates. You set a timer on your damn watch for 10 minutes and you go someplace quiet and you sit there and you just are quiet and you count your breaths. And whenever you think of something, you start thinking about an assignment, you think about an email, <clears throat> you think about the attractive person that walked by in the coffee shop, whatever it is, you go, oh, I just thought of something. And then you go back to counting your breath. It's as easy as that. Go Google easy ways to meditate. You'll find a billion. Okay, so let's say you for, roll for your what eyes. it's worth. I for what it's worth, I do the same thing. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I want to echo that statement of I think a lot of especially a lot of guys are like, that's not for me. My meditation is like lifting weights in the gym. Um, I do it not as regularly as maybe I should. But we were even talking to our business coach today, and he goes, "Hey, when was the last time you meditated?" I was like, ah, oh, it's been a minute. And he's like, I can tell. <laughs> you need, well, like, you mean, need to you need to do that. Take that time for yourself. So they, it is, they, it's they important. And top, I suck at it, but you just bring it back to your breath. Like, you suck at everybody. The, the, yeah. the greatest monk, like Buddhist monks in the world will tell you they suck at it. You're not supposed to be good at it. It's, it's a work in progress. But- you know, they, they always say that, you know, the, 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 you always can look, go read tools of Titans, right? The higher, highest performers of the world. The one thing that they all have in common, most right. of them is some sort of meditative practice. All of them, all of the Titans of industry, the, all of the, the geniuses, all of the great, whether you're talking about, you know, Dr. Huberman, whether you're talking about Joe Dispenza, whether you're talking about Anthony Robbins, whether you're talking about, you know, uh, uh, um, Jeff Bezos or whoever, they all have some sort of meditative practice. Okay. So if you can't do that, or it's not resonating with you, then it's taking your mind out of this world. So it might be reading fiction and that enables you a 10, 15 to 30 minute before you go to bed, reading a book of fiction, not, not, you know, the history of world war II or the fall of the Roman empire, not, not that necessarily, because that, that creates a different sort of brain, but going into another world, whether it's reading a detective mystery or, uh, um, fantasy novels or superhero stuff or Harry Potter, or Lord of the Rings, or bazillions of other things. And I think that that gives us the capacity to activate a different part of our brain that is not present in the moment and in the world that we're living in right now. I think if you sit down and read another self-help book, you're just going to start to cycle and be like, now I've got, a, now they're saying you need to light, you know, incense every day. And now I've got, you know, there's always that other thing and you become competitive. Um, and I think the other thing is, is to find somebody that you can connect with, especially men, sorry, because men are the worst at this. Find somebody you can connect with, one person, not a group, one person that you can connect with where you can just have like real conversations. And if you're fortunate enough to have a parent alive or a grandparent or an elder, then maybe it's that person because they have a perspective that's different than yours. And and just talk to them, you know, or a friend and just schedule it. You know, say, hey, would you be down with every and the life is busy? Can we just get on the calendar once a week for 30 minutes? or an hour, or can you come over for coffee, or can we have a drink together, or can we go get a burger together, and just just talk. I just want to, I want to complain about work, I want to complain about this, or I want to talk about something that's on my mind. And then last but not least, because people complain about being lonely. There, there's a lot of people that complain about being lonely. And I think loneliness is a pan, is, wor, is the worst pandemic that exists right now, especially in the Western world. I think people are freaking lonely. 
and they're disconnecting from friends. They're disconnecting from, they go out, they go on date nights, they go out, they have the social drinks, they talk about the social things, they talk about the football game, they talk about this, and then they go back to whatever. Um, and then last but not least is I think you've got a journal. I just think you got a journal. I think mm-hmm. you got to take the thoughts that are in your head and write them down and pour them out. And I think if you do that, then you create the currency that you need to be able to invest in the emotional bank accounts of other people. I think in absence of that, then you're you're basically the Fed and you're printing money that isn't valued and isn't worth anything. Great analogy. Well, I do want to share, you, you mentioned earlier in this, um, before we wrap up, you had mentioned, you know, doing therapy, you know, on a weekly basis. And I think that kind of ties back into the loneliness thing. Like a lot of people are lonely. And I think that, I mean, part of some of that, part of some of those ideas or things where you can find time to develop that currency to put in the emotional bank account is talking with somebody, whether that's like conventional forms of therapy or like just being able to talk to a friend. The cool thing for you and I and Matt is that we get to almost do that through the podcast. Like I, I think that's one of the things I love about our our show selfishly at this point, but that I enjoy about it is that we get to have these kinds of conversations. I mean, you and I haven't talked in a couple of weeks, like since you got back from all like the crazy busy work stuff, like you got back from crazy busy work stuff, or maybe it never stopped. And then mine picked up. And so we've had a mismatch in calendars. And so it's nice to have the podcast for that opportunity for us as, yeah. as friends. And, and for the 91 people that downloaded every episode, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm going to add a couple zeros to that someday. Yeah, exactly. Well, listen, everything that I said is, you know, especially as it relates to you, it's not, obviously it's not a criticism and it's obviously me holding up the mirror as well. I think we're struggling. A lot of people are struggling right now with feeling worthy. I think a lot of people are struggling right now with feeling like they matter and that what they're doing matters as well. Um, and I think... Some of these things are worth talking about, maybe having some more of a conversation, but I'm glad we got to talk about it. I appreciate the opportunity to to kind of connect with you on that. I hope it it kind of helps people up their emotional bank out, like earn that, get that currency ready so that you can be somebody that pours into other people. So anyway, on that note, I think think you're going to go meditate and I'm going to go call somebody and tell them I love them and and maybe do that. I'm going to journal. I got my five minute journal right here. So I think I might hit that up. Real Journaling quick. is an amazing thing. So listen, advice, I just want to, I want to tell everybody that we really do appreciate you. And for the people that, that follow us and consume our podcast, it means a lot to us. So, um, on behalf of John, Matt and I, we're extremely grateful to be able to be part of your journey. Make sure that you're um, building up that currency, taking care of yourself, doing some of those things. It's well worth the investment, probably the best investment you can make. Till the next time, we wish you well from all of us here at Above Board with Candor Path. Be well.